Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On today's show, I talk to a musician who is based in Milwaukee, which is a few hours away from where I live. I've actually met him before on a different podcast I used to do where I talk to other musicians uh, who do Creative Commons music, much like I do. He's released an album on his birthday every year for 15 years, and he just released another one. So we talk a bit about the project coming up, about the different stuff that he's done while recording these albums over the past 15 years, and we I think we geek out a little bit on gear a little bit, or even recording stuff like that, but it's always fun to talk to another musician and just kind of pick their brain and talk back and forth. And also he's nearby, so it's nice to meet a musician that I could actually probably go see. So that's always fun. And uh, also this is the last episode for this season. So if you want to be on the show, if you're an artist or if you're doing something, or if you'd like to talk about projects that you have, or uh, I'd really like to talk to a lot of people who have been selling online over this pandemic and how it's worked for you and what's changed and what you've learned from it. So if you want, email Tom at TomRaysWebsite.com or you can message me on Instagram, uh, message me on my Facebook page, which is Facebook.com slash website. Any of those places, get a hold of me and we can book uh, we can book an interview. We can get together and talk. We can uh, do the show. So I'm going to be taking a month or so off while I do some more interviews, but uh, don't forget to go to TomRaysWebsite.com and check stuff out. I'll be continuing to do my vlogs and other things there and just kind of documenting what I do about my day from time to time. So here's my interview with Kulla, the musician from Milwaukee that I just spoke of, uh, starting right now. My name is Kulla and I'm a musician from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So how long have you been in Milwaukee? I've been in Milwaukee for, well, my whole life, basically. Okay, you are, you are a native of Milwaukee. I'm a, yeah, I'm a native Milwaukeean um, and I spent about two years in Dublin, Ireland oh. for my graduate school and then that was about it. Then I'm back here again. <laughs> Wait, what was the graduate school for? What did you go to Ireland for? I went to Trinity College in Dublin. I went there for a master's in music and media technologies. Okay. So it was, a, it was like a hybrid fine arts and electrical engineering program. That... <laughs> well, and here's my question. <laughs> it's, I just, sorry, the, my question itself made me laugh. Um, so they were like, the school you read here, they're like, we can't possibly teach you this here. You need to go to Ireland to learn it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, part of it was me wanting to get out. Oh, exactly. Part of me was... Part of me wanted to, you know, my my father and grandfather are obsessed with our Irish heritage, and we, they, you know, they have photos of all the gravestones and like, and uh, my dad's really you know, taken out as as one of his main hobbies is genealogy, just trying to uh, trying to f find where we came from, and he's got, he's able to get records of people coming off the boat, oh, you wow. know, straight to straight to America, and he's got you know, there's different. Um, there's different threads. There's, you know, the genealogy is a long, is a big tree. You can get lost in the tree, I'm sure. But um, yeah, so that's always been a part of it. It's definitely influenced my artistic mind from all the beautiful art and um, the right, great writers and storytellers and and musicians and stuff from Ireland. So I've always, always, my parents would always play Irish traditional music growing up stuff. And um, my uncles are very proud of that sense too on my mom's side. So it came from both sides. So I, I had that sense there and I just felt like I needed to get a change of scene and grow in a different place. And there wasn't, I mean, you said, yes, like they, well, they couldn't teach you that here. Well, like I, there isn't, there wasn't really a master's program that did that, that I could find here in the United States. Berkeley is probably the closest, but I was, I was just like, I am more strong in my engineering. Like I was just, like I didn't, I didn't, I'm not formally taught music theory. Right. So like I, I, I'm, I have, I have a good aural training background. Like I can hear things and I'm, you know, I can pick up melodies and I can hear things naturally and stuff. And I played piano growing, but growing up, but I never was taught the theory. My, my, my teacher would mark every, um, mark every song that I would play as if it was in C major. 
Which, mm -hmm. So like she would mark every accidental. So if any anyone any non musical people out there, just means like I didn't have to learn any theory. I just read the notes as if it was one key all the time. I only learned one key essentially. <laughs> yeah. In terms of theory, and the easiest one. So the one that doesn't even have any sharps or flats, you have to mark them. So I but I was able to. So I basically just I didn't really read the music as much. I just heard it. I knew what it sounded like, and then I would just fumble through it, and then I'd learn it and learn it that way. Um, instead and was able to memorize some of my favorite, you know, Beethoven and Mozart and stuff that I would play in that uh, by memory and stuff at a certain time when I was the most into it at that at that time. So so I, I went there and it was it was attractive because there was a really big engineering element in this program and it was very broad. You could I could choose a lot of different things to go down and different ideas and just kinda like touched a little on a little things, but I knew I needed to I knew I wanted a to do a big project, and I, it, it ultimately was the catalyst for me to be able to call myself a musician, like I just, you know, right. like I just said. And uh, before that, I would call myself an engineer or something, and because I went to engineering school at Marquette, oh. um, and so, for my undergrad for computer engineering. Okay. So, so that that's where I still felt comfortable, and I still felt I was feel like I was dipping my toes into being a full time musician, and that was gonna be the springboard. I could come back and I could be like, I studied in Ireland and right. I and like I sang a folk song when I was you know when everyone was drunk and the bartender gave me a free Guinness so now I'm an honorary. <laughs> You've I, made I, it. <laughs> I made it. I made it. Yeah. So it, that um, that's that's basically why I decided to go there and I'm itching. I'm itching to start moving again. I've been here now five years after coming back from from Ireland just to get my because I have a lot of roots here. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of network, and the rent is un, uh, like unbeatable. <laughs> like, in Milwaukee? Oh yeah, I really? I have a really good really good rate here in River West. I guess I really never thought spot. about it, huh? <laughs> yeah, I uh, you can find good apartments for under six hundred bucks in River West. My first my first apartment was with three guys. Granted, you have to, usually you have to have roommates, right? But uh, I had three roommates, including myself. So there's three there's three guys and my first place was three thirty, three hundred thirty dollars. See, I remember month. that like years ago when I first moved out, and that's the what it cost, and that's yeah. not the case anymore, or at least here in Madison, yeah. it's like to live downtown, it's like I want to say around eight hundred to a thousand or something like that. I don't know. You can find good spots here, and you know, I I like this neighborhood, River West, and it's still relatively cheap. All the all the values or property values are going up, but this landlord that I have is my amazing. I love work like. I love, I love it. So I'm not, I'm even if I move, like I probably will still keep this place and sublet it, <laughs> you know, just in case. Turn it into an like, Airbnb when you know you yeah. can actually do such a thing. <laughs> I just like, you know, keep my name on at least just in case, you know, yeah. just just in case. So I'll sublet it. No, but I, I do. I feel like I'm reaching a. Before COVID, it was I was going to be touring. Mm -hmm. I canceled. I had a whole West Coast and East Coast tour book oh, and did. planned. Yeah, I was I was gonna I was so pumped for it. I was just building up. I was th felt like my whole career, everything was building up to that moment. Yeah, and then and then yeah, every, we all know what happened well, during COVID. And but, and you you pivot and you adjust. I mean, first of all, right. I want to know how did you so how did you go about booking the tour? And also, was it a solo tour? It was not a solo tour. It was my it was gonna be my first like full tour with a band. I was I had just fundraised enough for a van. I was gonna get like the first fat chunk of a van that I was gonna get. Um and yeah, it was my first tour tour with that. But I had played a solo a small solo tour down in Texas. Okay. Um and like went through St. Louis and played in Texas and then I picked up my sister in Houston and then we played a couple shows. Oh, we cool. played a show in Houston because she's a musician as well. And she, uh, we're trying to work on her her debut EP. It takes time. She's writing a novel instead. That's taking a lot of her a lot of her focus. <laughs> but we we're you know, we went there and went down and it was basically just I had a I had a giant Google Sheets database that yeah. of just of things that I just entered and I just emailed and called everybody and just had a fucking had a copy and paste and would just cold email. Just everyone with my just with what I thought they needed to hear to make it as simple and easy as possible, and uh -huh. to try and and you know I sent them you send them the EPK, you send them a couple of videos, you send of good videos of performance that I have, and and yeah, and and then a lot of and at the same time you have to be reaching out to bands and stuff too, right? 
so like I some some venues wouldn't care and they'd be like yeah like let us know when you find the other bands and the other some venues would be like no we need a guaranteed draw mm-hmm. and that's part of why the band getting the other bands too is like it's I you it's the first time in a city everyone's like it's your first time like I can't trust that you're gonna just draw people like, right and the, and and I, which is understandable mm-hmm. you know and but it depends on the venue some venues you know will are uh will take anybody and uh and those are those are harder to find and and you know you want there's i don't know it was my first time doing that so it was a lot of emailing i was being to i was going to be the tour manager i was going to be the production manager i was going to be because you didn't have anything else to do apparently (laughs) yeah i i have i didn't have enough things i needed to be doing or you know at the time for releasing an album and and planning the tour and stuff but so in a way, I mean, I say that because I, I mean, in a way, it was a kind of a huge relief in a, in a bad. Yeah, right. like, I was so disappointed, but it was actually a relief because I was like, I was thinking about all that: being the tour manager, the the mm-hmm. band manager, the production manager, the the marketing person, the the and the performer, and the you know, and the merch person, and everything, and the driver, and I have to keep track of all the costs. Mm-hmm. I have to, you know, I don't so make sure that my band isn't starving or freezing or whatever well, at that point it, it, even you describing that like why do you even want to do that like <laughs> <laughs> I, that's a great question i i mean i i want to do because i well i had a new album and i had bought 300 vinyls that i needed to sell <laughs> okay <laughs> and i mean that's part of the that's part of it I, I wanted to get my feet wet with the touring i had a lot of a lot of fans being like when are the tours when are the tours when are the tours and i Part of coming back from Ireland was, and making that transition was going into live performance. After that, I had never performed live music really. Um, maybe maybe once or twice in college, I played um, as MC Culla before right. before before 2015, and it was basically just me uh, singing karaoke over my beats. You know the stuff that I made, and mm-hmm. which was it was cool. It was fun at the time. Like I played at the rave for rjd2 which was awesome oh, nice. and i got i got pumped up i got bumped up to to the main stage i was just i was playing in the in the side and i was like oh damn i'm playing the side like whatever and <laughs> but then they came to me like hey the opener to the opener is gone so he's not they're not showing up so you're now that and i was like whoa so they're like yeah i go on the main stage and talk to the sound guy and i was like my first show ever i didn't know it was good like and it's at the huge stage of the rave that i'd seen the white stripes play it you know right like and I was just like, wow, this, this is amazing. I was able, yeah, but, uh, so it, I, I started doing performance after that, essentially, like after I came back and, um, touring has always been something on my mind and I just know it's a vital part of make, making connections with mm-hmm. people, especially through music. Like I've had some, I've made lifetime fans from performances, like, it, it it changes people's perspective. It changes people, even friends and family, when they come and they see a performance, they like, well, they, it change it. I, maybe it's, I don't know what it is, but I, sometimes I sense like a switch or something. They like, they'll, they understand something more or they have, I mean, you've been to live performance, you're a musician, right. like, you know, you understand this, but, but, uh, the, it's, it's a special, it's a special thing to, to, be in a room with live music and everything. It is. And it makes makes genuine connections. And and it like of the people all the people that listen to our music, them to have that experience too is that's the, that was the goal is to is to allow that like for me to meet people that like want me to succeed. Like that's what I want to meet. Yeah. I want to meet those people. And I wanna I wanna like you know see see what see what it's like. See what see what I it, my, what impact the music even has I've, and i haven't had like, I, that was my hope and opportunity to do the tour and we'll do it again next year mm-hmm. if i was able to do it if I, that one time i can i think i'm more prepared now this like this year has you know, like you said you pivot and i've been able to like reshuffle things and like and prior prioritize things this year differently yeah and and so i'm not even really worried about live performances although things are coming up in the in in the summer here, but yeah, so that, I mean, I just did it DIY. I just did it DIY. I just made it a giant list, just email everybody. Where did, you, where did you find the information for that list, by the way? You can, I mean, it's not like you just go clubs 
in America? And, and, you know, what are the con- what's the content? Like, how did you even well, find all this information to contact these people? Well, luckily, I had a buddy who was touring. He's he was he was an ex he's an ex engineer as well and just turned okay. musician. Uh, his name is Pretty Beggar, uh, and that's his artist name, Michael Castle. And he he had a database that he was working on, and he had and so it was a collaborative collaborative Google Sheet essentially. Oh, okay. Um, so he had some, and it there was a solid amount of information there that was useful um, for certain regions that he had used. Um, some of them didn't work, but like everyone was using, like there's me and him and maybe one other person that was using it. Um, and yeah, we'd go and we just clean up the data and just use it and use it ourselves. He even had it more advanced where he had a little script. Um, and that's I was probably just going to say, doing. I realized when you said we cleaned up the data, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm talking to two engineers, about two engineer guys. Of course you had a Google sheet right. that was all set up and probably had some scripts around it in it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, and that's the thing. He's like, yeah, man, I just, at a point I just wrote a script and I just said where I wanted to go and then, you know, press a button and boom, it sends emails to, you know, 50 people instead of copy paste. Oh, did I get the name right? I, like that was the worst right. thing. Like, yeah. I definitely once or twice accidentally emailed person being like, Hey, insert name here. And right. I had forgot, I had forgot to copy and paste something or like where it was obvious that I had sent this email to another. And that's super unprofessional and super, <laughs> yeah. you know, like it, it but it was but a I mistake. Mean, what are you, you know, going to do? Early. I mean, there's, th- that happens. I mean, that they happens know, on yeah. like the best email lists where you go, can do yeah. the insert name. And if it's not there or like there's some error in like a MailChimp uh, newsletter, right. it'll say like, you know, F name or whatever the input merge tag is or whatever the hell. So I don't know. It's, yeah, no, I, I, I'm, it's just part of the learning process, man, you know? Yeah. Well, and speaking of the learning process, like with not being able to tour and adjusting, like what what would you say you actually learned from this past year? Because you've been very active online. It's much like a lot of us, especially people who promote themselves or create things. You can look back at like the way you started out doing it and like where you're right. at now, like making videos on your YouTube channel or things like that, like the live streams that you've been doing. Like what have you learned from all that? I learned, yeah, that's a great question. I, I learned, (laughs) I learned that it's very important to have your digital assets monetized and (laughs) create in creating recover recurring, uh, value Mm -hmm. for like, like pay dividends. And like, I, I had been performing and planning this tour, but that was my first tour after 14 years of creating these, these, you know, some intellectual property that is, that is collecting value for me mm-hmm. and allowing me to, to, to pay my cheap rent here, you know, like, and that's what allows me to make, become the full-time musician. I think that was one of the thing one of the, one of the things I learned this year was how important that is for everyone to have that safety net of at least having some digital assets that, I mean, the musicians, you have them, they have them. It's, it's just, I, I, I definitely, I had a greater realization of that. I was able to, understand a lot more about how licensing works and about publishing and diving more into the business of music really this last year and to prepare again for when I have to go back out and really approach it and attack it. And, uh, but I mean, I learned, I learned a lot of, uh, things with this next, this last album. I mean, just like the, it's, uh, like I learned a lot more about gain staging like I uh, experienced it, which is this process in engineering where hmm. each each source of the, or like essentially each thing that can create sound and through, you know, you got one thing with a cable that's of audio going to another thing, then a cable of audio that goes to another thing. They all have volume knobs, mm-hmm. right? So everything, or gain knobs, whatever, every, each stage, like you can, you can, it, and I'm not an I'm not an electrical engineer. I I I was more into software, so like right. I I can't really explain the how it, it essentially works from a at a physical level. Um, I I had a podcast you know it my, when you see it because you've seen it. <laughs> you can just hear like, it. You I can hear it. it. Yeah, I can hear it. That's the that's the main thing. You can hear it and feel it. And and um, once you understand what it is, essentially, you don't, when you have super loud uh, at the very end, like the last stage. If that's the thing that's turned all the way up and you're just like, why is it so quiet? And you keep turning it up. Mm-hmm. You might actually just be turning up noise, essentially. Like you're, because these yeah. other ones, these other ones are really quiet and all that's coming through is basically noise with a little bit of volume. And so when you turn up the last one all the way, 
you know, it, and, and that was something I just realized because I was <clears throat> because I was doing the live streaming because I had two separate computers with two separate interfaces. Ah, okay. And, I was so going to say had, where where was the chaining that you were doing? <laughs> okay, that it makes wasn't sense. even that much. It was just one extra thing for yeah. my normal stuff, but that made a huge difference because like, well, I had it wasn't just one extra thing; it was actually two because I had a little mixer going into that interface, and then that interface went into another interface. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if those are the wrong, if one's at 44.1 kilohertz and the other one's at 48 kilohertz, it's also going to screw it up. So you have to, like, match the bit rates. I think those are bit rates. I don't remember what that's called. But, the, yeah. but um, so, so that, I mean, that's a technical thing I learned. I mean, I learned a lot about, uh, I did a lot of reading in, uh, into Carl Jung, I, like, and, and, um, so I was I really started to get activated in the knowledge of archetypal psychology, hmm. and I guess they call it depth psychology. Okay, which is essentially just all based on Jung's work. But um, and that that was one of the most interesting things that I learned this last year, just diving into all that. Just learning Have you about been wanting to learn about psychology or what, like why? I mean, that all I, of a sudden yeah. we're talking. I'm like psychology. <laughs> what? I mean, this is what I, this is the this is it, it's you know it's some of its research for songs right you know like okay it, all right but it's yeah, I do want to learn I mean I'm I've always loved I'm a master of none you know like I I always love just learning different aspects of things and I I really wanted to term, for really for my myself like for for I mean self in Jungian psychology is is a thing to achieve at the it's like the, the psyche is a circle and self is a little dot infinitely going into the circle and so you just it's the thing that you're always reaching for you can never attain self like it's just this ideal concept okay and so everything is all around that so it's just it's just this under my aunt is a is a um a Jungian psychologist and okay. it's something that I, I i really i tried to do it from you know i tried to uh learn some other types of psychology and stuff but they just didn't have the same like uh there wasn't the mystic component to it there wasn't a it wasn't a mystical and um, like apocalyptic thing where it's like this experiential thing where you, where you, it 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 was it's all it's all about dreams and stuff which I've had crazy okay. dreams since I was a kid. I was wondering and where you were going with the mystical stuff, and I'm like, what? <laughs> but dreams, well, yeah, that Young, makes sense. Young, that... Young was a he was a uh, an alchemist. Okay. So like he and same with so many great scientists in, in history and stuff, and <clears throat> all all those those things are is that. It's just the early, the early understandings of what makes up the universe and its very core, and how and how are they in certain energies and stuff where you can relate it to. I'm not really super well versed in all that, like the the mystic uh, traditions, the mystery tradi the mysteries, or they call them, like or the mystery schools and all these things, right. where it's just the, the basics of trying to. I don't know. Essentially, what helps me figure out is there's two there's two main concepts in it that really helped me this last year is the shadow concept of the shadow <clears throat> and the concept of the anima and the the shadow is essentially all the repressed parts of of what of of ourselves that we hide that we it's like it's an, another analogy is like a big bag that you shove all these things in hmm. um, and it could be from society it could be your family it could be culture that's like don't be like this don't do that don't do you know through shame or guilt which is nat those are natural social things to do but the the you know they can they can cause issues of course too and if you're if you're trying to suppress parts of who you are and what makes humans humans and if you're you know pr you're not acknowledging that right and that you're hiding it and you're putting it in a shadow that it actually comes out through through it, it comes out through through the subconscious out, outward projected onto other people and so people who are hiding parts of these ne negative aspects of themselves actually end up you know projecting it outwards and putting it putting it onto other people or putting it onto stuff and and so it's just like this concept of self-love and of understanding the negative aspects of things and trying to be okay with that and actually understand that that's actually super important it's called shadow integration okay. about and I mean, it, it made sense to me. At the, like when you think about, uh, I came from a Catholic, Irish, you know, Catholic family, and we uh, we learned this about, uh, you know, maybe you've heard the story of, of Jesus being tempted in the desert by the by by the devil. It's that idea of being tempted, right? Like you you can you can understand you have these negative things, like 
there's been times where you want to punch someone in the face, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't punch them in the face because you know that you sh that's probably not the right thing to do. <laughs> but you you could, right? And right. you could, and and that's and that's just I that's just basically it. It seems maybe maybe um, silly or something, but it it's actually really important to me at least to to understand that I okay I'm capable of doing this and I choose not to and try to try to build that awareness and let those things be there and be okay with it instead of just hiding it are you, you know and being and, are you in a situation where you want to punch people in the face a lot <laughs> that was a pretty quick example you had there ready to go <laughs> yeah or or driving someone over i always just like turning the car oh my God, wheel that's, or, that's actually like, the the biggest one right there is yeah. why is it if you were walking in a hallway and you accidentally bump into someone or step in front of somebody you would turn and go oh sorry but if it's in a car, suddenly this person is your moral enemy and you want to chase them down and yell at them or bash their car. Like, what is the difference between road that? Rage. Yeah. yeah, like road rage is one that I've never understood. And I'm I mean, everyone's guilty of it. But why is yeah. that different? If you were standing in line and someone did that, unless they reacted like, you know, whatever, I'm better than you, you, you might be like, huh, well, hell with you. But if somebody did that and they went, oh, sorry, you'd be like, ah, don't worry about it. Yeah. But if they did think, that in a car, boom. I think it's because... Yeah, I feel like the adrenaline must be going in like you're first you're contained in your own space. If you're standing in line, you're you you actually have to ex, you actually can read the other person's body language and you can like and you can see what's happening. Yeah. If you're in a, and you're separated when you're in a car, you're separated and you're in like a you know two ton killing machine. So like right. I feel like that well, that's the heightens worst part. that heightens the the stress, yeah, <laughs> you know what maybe. I mean? Or it's like, I don't know, maybe. That's, don't, or that's it makes you thought. feel invulnerable, you know, like you don't think you can be touched because you're being blocked by Right, this. and so, that, yeah, it's like being on the internet, right, and being a troll, right? Oh, just that's yelling actually at a good shit, example. You know? Yeah. It's like you're more anonymous. You can read their license plate, but you're pretty much anonymous unless you actually hit them and you have to deal with the insurance shit, but even then you don't want anything to do with the person, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you don't want it. you just want to know that hopefully you'll get some of your shit paid for. I love but, it. We've so far covered psychology <laughs> and uh, real uh, real estate. So, <laughs> but yeah, that, um, I've been learning a lot of things. That's the point. No, that's I've good. Learning, and I'm sure yeah. a lot of people have. I mean, there was that brief period where everybody was learning how to make sourdough bread. Um, yeah. And uh, going down to the river and reading some Carl Jung and thinking about shit. Well, and you also. <laughs> so one thing I do want to know about is you said uh, the importance of monetizing because. Um, the the one thing and there it's always been the argument is like you know as far as music music is like an image online it's just something that mm -hmm. people can share download and it's like well you just look for it that's the way it is you go to this and there's the music you don't think about you, you assume like if you're listening on Spotify people are getting paid which they are you know just whatever it, getting paid more than if you were to download their stuff and just play it over and over again uh, but now that you couldn't play shows because that was always the thing is you can sell physical stuff there you can play, get paid for, get paid for the show no you don't um most of the places it'll be like oh here's 25 bucks for playing an hour um sorry that was a weird rant uh and then uh, oh, weird. it's true <laughs> i know and uh but how how did you decide to because that's really one of the hardest things is because is. music is just something that's on the internet like it, it people get some people are like well i'm not going to pay for that it, which is their right. I mean, when I walk into a convenience store, there's all these, this gum there doesn't mean that I have to buy all the gum that's there. So how have you been monetizing or what have you learned about monetizing what you do? Well, a lot of what I learned was just like uh, kind of relearning things that I already had. I mean, you're very well, well, very well aware of creative commons, right? So yes. like the, the, I, and that's why it's, it, it might seem counterintuitive for me to say, cause I have release all my music free under creative commons and actually mm -hmm. open source too. Like people can go and download. Not enough people do that. I think I don't push it as much. I've kind of just still like, Oh man. Uh, uh, but the, there's this, there's this phrase, I forget what it is. I think it's in Taoism or something where it's like you, 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 uh, master has no possessions. Like you, you, if you give everything out, you give everything away, you'll, you can get everything back. Like, you have to be you have to be willing to do that and i feel like i mean with creative commons you're able i'm able to get free syncs essentially by releasing my music for free i get it all over youtube right i get it all over podcasts and in games right. indie games and stuff like so many people come to my car mechanic simulator 2018 baby that's oh my the god one. i'm in that too <laughs> nice hell yeah they, nice that, that's the one they go they go they yeah. went for creative commons apparently there's a whole 
radio station that's like all like my entire discography it's just mm -hmm. one radio station <laughs> and i get so many people coming and, and it's like, wow. the weirdest game because it's literally you're a mechanic working in a shop and a radio is playing in the background while you right. work on cars and yeah that's where because somebody said because what they normally do is they'll comment on your video going found this in exactly you know, whatever game it was cm18 <laughs> cms18 or yeah yeah so that i mean i learned actually the the streams of revenue i guess is that's the real thing about monetizing monetizing is just kind of a big a blanket word for just making sure you're making money you make money from a thing right and and so what i'm the, the stuff that i get is mostly spotify like you you say that they pay people and i kind of chortle a little bit they do pay people mm -hmm. that's true but the but and I would argue that it, I mean it's like what point zero zero three cents per stream or something like that. Depending um, on how many streams that day, like it's it's right. actually a percentage of the day. Right. So yeah, yeah. they they just they make an arbitrary way to pay people that they've right. decided and and it's not I stream when I stream your music on Spotify, it's not going to you that my, my nine ninety nine for my premium isn't going to go to you or whatever, or that ad targeted at me isn't going to go to you or right. whatever. It's, it's goes into the big pool and then they distribute it back out. And, um, and, um, but still the mo where everyone listens to music and still one of the best ways. I mean, it, it's the, it's my highest, um, streaming revenue. And, mm -hmm. and that's, um, one of the different ways that I didn't understand is I didn't fully comprehend that also ASCAP is going to be um, is ASCAP also collects Spotify royalties, and so does this company called Song Trust. Mm -hmm. And so essentially, I signed up for both of those, and then started seeing that oh, there's tons of this. There, I mean, it's not tons, but like there's money that's I've literally just been out there that's I haven't been collecting. And so just, you know, using that and trying to do that and um, where you have passive regular income, just as long as your people are listening, you know, you'll be able to do that. But then there's also, there's also other ways to, to, you know, Patreon is a great one or, you know, live streaming, you get donations in live streams and right. stuff too, which would be, which are great, you know, and, you know, live streaming is a great way to reach people. Um, yeah. But, but the, but yeah, that, that I did a lot of live streaming this last year. That's for sure. Uh, I would do it like weekly on Twitch and was just learning that. And I learned so much about how important interaction is. And that's, yeah. and that, and that's the, and it actually, it was difficult because at first to transition, because I knew it was going to be different than live performances, obviously, but I didn't really know how different. And I was coming in going into it kind of still with the same expectations of a live show. Just subconsciously, I was doing that. I was trying not to, but I went in and it was just like I play this song and I'm trying to pour my heart out into this song, and then, and then it's you know if I don't look at the chat, there's nothing. It's just like it's just me playing to a screen, right? right. And well, so and then in the same know. concept, you're you're pouring your heart out, and at the same time, the chat is like, "What's that keyboard you're using?" You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, yeah, exactly. And, but that's but that's part of it, and that's really it. Like people want to engage with you; they're they're interested, and they have the ability to ask you that question. And that's the beauty of it. And, and yeah, that's like the thing that uh, kind of turns it around. But you could also go down the rabbit hole of all of a sudden you're just having a conversation with someone. You have to learn how to kind of yeah. balance it. <laughs> yeah, that was the learn. That was the learning about like essentially how how does a live how what is the best way to run the live stream the way that I want it? Like mm -hmm. that I still want to be able to have those musical elements, but I. I understand that interaction with the people in the chat or whoever is listening. That is actually the primary focus mm -hmm. is, is the, and, and that's, that's the thing that I, that I didn't, that I learned was, you know, cause I knew that I like had a feeling of it, but you don't really know it till you live stream every week for right. three months or whatever. Like, you know, then, and that's, and I, you know, I, I was messing around with this Ableton push, like B pad and trying to like, I just did all improv essentially. Occasionally I'd play a song of mine, but all those live streams were just improv learning. And so not, you know, I wasn't like really pushing them that hard. I was try I was just trying to do it just from, just cause I knew I was learning and I was, I'd call it failing in the open, mm -hmm. <laughs> failing out in the open. Cause that's, you know, essentially what it is. It's like, well, if you want to come along and see what kind of weird, you know, things I'm going to noodle on today, then 
yeah, come join and and people people you know they look forward to it and stuff. Consistency is a huge one too, like having regular days and. I only did it once a week, and it would switch sometimes, and so like it was it was tough for everyone to keep keep track of it and keep keep coming on. Uh, but um, for a while there, it was great, um, and I was able. It was it was it was super fun. Um, I'll definitely start doing that again at some point. But it's just like 64 and sunny out, you know. It's like right. oh, man, and I'm just like, oh yeah, live streams sound great, but. Outside is great too. <laughs> I like well, that's it. why I like to do them at night. Whenever I and I'd like to do more of them nice. too. I've yeah, only done a few. Idea. Yeah, and in the uh, plus, I feel like especially on Twitch, nighttime is the time where I feel people are more on it, just because of the gaming aspect or the gaming background of it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm sure they have some some data on that. Yeah. It's also a global platform. True. And so, and I think that's. I mean, because yeah, at so night in England, here, it would be like it'd be, it'd be in the morning, morning right? I don't yeah. be waking up, and then in Singapore or whatever, there'd be like going to bed or some or who knows or I don't even know. Yeah, I'd have some people from Singapore oh, that come come on that, and that was a big thing that I had to figure out too with timing. Was like, oh, who who are the fans? Because there's a lot from Germany and people and stuff, and people would be like, this is way too late for me, man. Like I, but I'm here anyway. It's like Friday night, and they're like staying up all night, and that was you know. That's their crazy stay up all night and just right. watch and and that's fun, you know. But I would still much rather. Wait, are you talking uh, about Mark Hollenbeck? <laughs> yeah, I mean, sure, he's one of them. Yeah, the, the, he yeah, with, he's always on the. He he would I I I had a lot, Friday live stream right after Rhino Rhino the bearded yeah. pot thing, and he would just come right there. He's like, I'm re, I've refilled my my drink and I'm I'm here. And I'm staying all night. Like this is great. Like I get two shows. And Rhino would just be like, "All right, everybody, go watch Color now." I'm like, "Actually, that's not that's actually not not a bad thing to." And people do that on Twitch. They they'll uh, I guess they call them raids, yes. where they'll they'll finish a stream and then they'll point everyone to a different stream. And I got raided once with my buddy from my buddy Pretty Beggar, who was who was um, doing Twitch at the same time, and so we were kind of both tackling it. And nice. we would call we would call each other and be like, "What you okay?" And he he went after the games though. He was he was playing Animal Crossing. Mm-hmm. And creating this like really, really like nice environment for. He had all these kids that were playing, and he was just kind of being like a teacher and a mentor, and like hmm. providing opportunities for these kids to just like be heard and like and communicate. And they would work together in this game, and he would set up games, and he would. He would it was like, wow, this is actually really the, some of the most wholesome thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> like it was super nice. But yeah, that was that was one. The live stream was another thing that I learned. I don't. Yeah, that. But there's uh there's a whole mess of things. Started to yeah the quarantine was such a strange strange time. But I I was able to just you know enjoy the. Luckily it was in the summer for half the half of it, and right. I was able to go out and walk every day, you know, by the river and just and try to enjoy the fact of that solitude and, no, and be like, well, this was going to be a crazy big tour year, and I was going to be super social and. Obviously, that's not the case. So you gotta you gotta pivot, like you said. You gotta mm-hmm. do what you gotta do. You gotta enjoy it. And so then I was able to just focus a little more on writing some intentional, deeper intentional music. And a lot of that Carl Young, like I was mentioning, Carl. Like, there's a lot of that stuff um, that sh- shows through the music. And like, uh, there's songs about about darkness and light, and about these different concepts. And um, do, you know, doing research on different types of mythology and stuff too which tied directly into the archetypal psychology actually the mm-hmm. it's that it's just it's the same idea of like when people worship gods right like when you when you have different archetypes of like this is a zeus and zeus does this and has this characters and this and this and this those those are different the, that's the archetype of, of humans like mm-hmm. that's that it's just what humans are capable of doing these types of things but it's 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 personified in this archetypal God image that people people do, and obviously there's tons of them and stuff, and so you can you can pick and choose whatever. You, oh, I feel like this God is, makes sense to me in this way and stuff, and that's just really right. an archetype. And so you can you can uh, so I you know I was diving into some mythology. Like I've always been fascinated uh, with um, early mystic Christian um, uh, r- mythology and stuff. Where recently there was a I mean recently not, I don't know, maybe within the last 50 years or 100 years, they found a lot of early Gnostic um, t- source texts, essentially. These old texts of hmm. 
other other things that are left in the Bible, like different gospels, Gospel of Judas and the Gospel of Mary and the Gospel of all the Gospel all these uh, different things and infancy gospels of Jesus when he was younger and all this stuff and completely different interpretations of Adam and Eve myths and stuff like and to begin and like totally different. Um, and a lot of this stuff is because I, I was able to get involved through it uh, through Joseph Campbell. If you ever heard of Joseph Campbell, who was amazing. Um, he, he wrote The Hero of a Thousand Faces and The Power of Myth, where he, he essentially broke down all the myths and using Jungian psychology and broke them down and kind of made them accessible to everyone and coined the hero's journey, hmm. which is, you know, the which is just based on just based on all these old stories. And there's this great uh, there's this great author called Rosa, uh, Robert Bly um, from he, he think he's from Minnesota. He started the Minnesota Men's Conference. So a lot of the stuff a lot of stuff was me entering into trying to understand my own masculinity and my own understanding because I'm turning 30 and I'm like feeling like right. this maturation is really kick, kicking in the gear. Well, and how <laughs> and much of, the, how much of this actually is going or, or is involved or part of the new album that you have coming out? Oh, it's like 75% of it all. Okay. Like I was maybe curious. Even, maybe even 100%. Like it like I have a song called Lucifer the Light Bearer, and it's literally all just about what I've learned about the the mythology of of Lucifer, which is so so different than like it, there's so much, uh, there's a great epic poem by Milton uh, called Paradise Lost, and in in there, um, it, I mean even even yeah just it, I mean that's a few hundred years old, but even then it's like they, they have a completely different understanding of myth. The word Lucifer is totally different. Like, and in Hebrew it means light bearer, light bringer. Like it's it's the and like in Milton's thing, he's almost a hero. Lucifer is a hero, and he like tries to rally people. And now now it's just a synonymous with Satan or the devil or something something right. evil. Or there's a fallen angel. It's like, well, what, why did he fall? Like, what, what is he doing? You know, like you got to read this read the stuff. And so, looking back, and I used, I I was just fascinated with this character and this shadow concept and like this idea of the anti anti hero being the hero. You know, like where where uh, people don't understand the dark thing that where it's like, oh, the it's it's a I don't know. You could hear the hear the music and and see for yourself. But it's 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 based in reach like actual research that I've I've done um, on these different uh, periods of time and their different ways of approaching spirituality and mysticism and how they made sense of the world. And there's there's a lot of little aspects of things that I've learned from essentially it's just Gnostic Christian like teaching, which is it's just cool stories that I think are yeah. that should be that are people are familiar with a lot of the Bible stories. Obviously in the Western world we all are super familiar with some with the stuff and so some of these just like really clean up some of the like questions and and make it it's they're more relevant. They and they make more sense to me. It's like they have a different way of approaching salvation completely. They believe that you're saved by experiencing and ex- by experiencing your own godhood or your own your own like star in yourself or do you want to call it your own spirit your mm-hmm. own like you have to do it you can't get it from someone else like you have to get it from yourself and you, you do it by experiencing uh, they call it gnosis that's where the gnostics kind of that's a greek yeah. word it means like exp- the knowledge you get from experience and it's a similar i find it to be similar than this to the word awen which is the symbol that i use for my for my work, which is an old Irish symbol, which means poetic inspiration. It's the same type of thing. It's just this experiential, uh, experiential way of of realizing your own <laughs> your own spiritual nature. You just have to realize. You have to experience it. You can't you can't get it from a from you know on an altar or something, or you can't get it from praying to something. You have to do it from your, do yourself. And the Adam and Eve story is so cool. The the Gnostic one is so different. So like they're actually slaves. In this, in a, in a, in a garden, and it's like there's this cherub with a sword that's on fire, which is dope. And it's like, <laughs> and it's like, I'm like, well, how's this not in the Bible? And when I was growing up, I'd be way more interested. Right. <laughs> if there was a chair with a sword, like that's some good, like cool old, like Jewish. It's, it's all, it's essentially Babies with like, lasers. I mean, you know, yeah, modern it up. Well, now we're talking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So it, there, there's, there's a, yeah, there's songs like that where, and I have a song with Tolkien. Uh, a Tolkien song, which I'm a huge fan of, of Tolkien. Like I, um, one of the greatest writers of all time. I like hands down. Like so, 
He, I was doing research into him and stuff too. He, he uh, studied languages, and yeah. he has this quote where he said that, like a musician hears melodies, I hear languages. And I was just like, what? How do you even do that? Well, and, and a lot of his books actually come with his own language and an appendix yeah. that explains it in the back of them. Yeah, a lot of, he come. He made the language first, and then wrote the stories from the languages. It's like, what? Like, and so this guy, he said, he said that he was believe, he was hearing old human languages, like that. He it was that he was tapping into the collective memory of humanity, and he was hearing old languages. That's what he said. He's like mm -hmm. he he believed that he wasn't making up anything new. He was he like Elvish was actually in all of human humans and that that's that I mean he he has very interesting views and stuff like that and the the really really a fascinating guy so I have a I have a book or sorry I have a, uh, a song called the two trees of Valinor and it's the the story of the and it it, it, it all of these follow like half things like that's part of the interesting part of why I was st studying this stuff is cuz a lot of these a lot of these uh, mystic roots are in these like I mentioned, a certain so some certain gods and certain things in these in these songs where they're the primordial duality myths, and the Gnostics were huge into dualism, and it's more much more like Zoroastrianism and like these early or these earlier uh, pre uh, pre Christian, you know, like it, it's essentially Jewish and it's like Jewish mixed with Greek. That's what the early Gnostics are. It's like the er Jew crazy Jewish mysticism with Neoplatonism, and that's like and that's what Gnosticism was at that time and and so they have these interesting duality gods and that's what this album is half I'm you know it's the half so I'm playing on all that stuff so the two trees of Valinor is one that's a gold tree and one that's a, a silver tree and they represent the sun and the moon and then and and it's this whole story and then this giant spider who like is darkness just the, is void it's like the great grandmother of that one spider in Lord of the Rings that ends up uh, you know the one that uh, ends up, um, you know, attacking Frodo and Sam or ever in the ca in the cave and stuff. So it's like, wow, this guy is crazy. He's thinking like, <laughs> I don't know. The whole the whole token thing is crazy. So here's that's what, yeah. here's, here's something that that I wanted, and also to point out because some people have probably never heard of you before. So how do you fit all this into uh, your style? Is actually a lot more like kind of pop funk sort of, I mean, not pop funk, I don't mean to put a label on it, but There's from, what, from what it, sure. yeah, but from what it, from what it sounds like right now, the way you're describing it, it sounds like we're going to be listening to Hawkwind or Marillion, you know, <laughs> <laughs> this, this two trees of Eleanor is a country like uh finger picking open D finger picking song with a pedal steel. Mm hmm. And uh, so it's like folk rock. Yeah. And that's what I wanted to point out is that like yeah. you're having it, it, now with these, how do you come up with the music that it's going to go over? I mean, for me, I know what it is. Yeah. It's just like, I'll have an idea and then I'll go, okay, the lyrics make me think of some, you know, some of my own dumb feelings. And, yeah. <laughs> and you're like got, coming up with concepts and I'm, I'm intrigued to know, like you just said that one is more of a country folk thing which i guess i could see how that works but um it's folky yeah it's just like i don't know it 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 is what it is i i i love all the genres like i i have pop funk stuff i have blues rock i have folk rock i have straight yeah. folk i have bluegrass i got electronic like there's a song there's a couple songs on this next album they're all like 100 this is a very up tempo album okay the two trees in valinor is actually the slowest song on the album the 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 and there's like there's some electronic ones. There's hip hop on this album. There's straight electronic. There's straight hip hop. There's a, there's a couple that I don't, I don't even know, dude. I don't know what they are. <laughs> but they're, but they're, it's like folk. It, I I just say psychedelic folk. I right. don't know. This is crazy. Yeah. Like it's, and it's crazy music. And uh and I'm sure there's good. I'm terrible with labeling this stuff. But no, and, I, and I, every musician is. It's it's because we hate to yeah. do it. <laughs> I don't think it even it doesn't even make sense. I try to put it in, but it's just like I, I'm I I cross disciplinary and multi genre, so like I I don't really think about what styles they're in. I guess I guess it's, I guess I do, um, but it just kind of happens naturally. I guess I guess there is. I mean, it's not it's not a formal part of my process, let's say, or my methodology. It's it just kind of the the concepts come out of the out of the songs themselves. So like I didn't think about oh well let me write about Tolkien in this style I was picking around with this thing and 
and then I was looking for inspiration and I was, it was right at the early part of COVID and there was this uh, Twitter watch party with this um, Tolkien scholar who was, oh. uh, and, and who did her like, she's a Tolkien scholar and the daughter of like a super famous astrologer archetypal astrologer which apparently is another thing where it's like uh, they just take the archetypes of what these planets mean and then they can and then you can find your own patterns and what that means to you in terms of this stuff which is really fascinating i learned a little bit about astrology hmm. which was really interesting about what it could be useful for if you want to find you know if you want to find ways to to um have patterns to analyze to have some growth in yourself right like well here's some patterns that never change like and they're moving in space <laughs> like, <laughs> like they're, they're going to be doing that like so maybe you can make some meaning out of that like and that uh so she she set up this whole watch party um and so then i got really inspired by tolkien again just by watching those ex three extended editions in the middle of quarantine having this little community hmm. thing with other people who were really interested and people were just like you know tweeting at each other and making things and i like made some friends i like on there on twitter or like uh where people were just and you know talking about Tolkien and talking about the movie as we were watching it together, and so and so she the, the scholar was giving really great I mean she's a scholar so of this so she, she was talking about you know what's different from the book than the movie and what and what what made the director make the decision to do this or what is that or here's the little Easter egg and this and this and or here's a fun fact about Tolkien making this thing or you know this one this one scene or that one character. What, and so, so it's just like, you know, it's just timing with that stuff is like, you gotta, you're open to receive these types of concepts. Like, and if you actively do it, it just kind of happens naturally in the songwriting process. It's like yeah. you have the song and you, I, at least the way that I do it is that I, I'm, I probably 95% of the time start with the sounds. I start with the melodies and the sounds and then I react. Um, to that, and I tried the 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 more <laughs> the more I think about it, the, l the less easy it gets. I feel like when you're in there, you just kind of have to let yeah. it let it fly and just let it go and just be in the flow state. It has to be reflexive, and so you like you have to think about it. you can ref you can reflect on it later and like be like okay, I need to inc incorporate these types of things. But that's the type of song writing that I do at least is is. I've always kind of done that. I've, I've, I've made, I'm getting more, but this, this last year with this intention of this album is to really, like, I did feel like I was doing research into this stuff because yeah. I feel like my job as a, as a musician is to be able to reflect, like you were saying, Oh, this person connected with these, you know, some, some sappy song lyrics that I wrote or something and they right. felt, and you feel that something about like, Oh damn. Yeah. I feel that too. Or, right. or the way that they said it or the way they sang it, like, ah, yeah, I feel that. And people, that's the type of connection um, that I really value in music, and that's what I want to give to it to people with my music is that feeling that they can that that same feeling like oh I can I can understand that mm -hmm. that thing or I can and and what it is is me finding that in myself and presenting it in a in a way where they can receive it and but, but then in that turn they they find that something in themselves yeah through that through that so me going into these parts about who i am and like it's just where i was feeling the most yeah you know so and so i just kind of follow those i follow those feelings i follow those emotions and i get and that when you do it enough you, you it becomes easier <laughs> and and it comes out i mean i'm not saying it's super easy this is a very difficult album to do but it takes a lot of time right and a lot of energy and well at discipline. least a year <laughs> at least yeah because <laughs> you release one yeah, every least, year <laughs> yeah i mean i'm sure i could have sped it up earlier and you know i kind of like dilly daddled a little bit at the beginning but i had songs written but like didn't finish and then and then it was a huge sprint at the last at the last few months um yeah. which is part of the fun <laughs> is to get a little manic you know why not? <laughs> and how are you releasing it? Are you doing physical copies this time around? Yeah, I, I'm. Uh, I had a fundraiser uh, f uh, that we reached, which was amazing. I had yeah, a lot I of saw great... that. It, yeah, people have. Been, I'm so glad I've been doing this. It, I highly recommend it to every musician, even if you don't like. I don't have like a huge following or anything, but I just. And that's what that's where it comes with, like just being honest and and just do it and, and asking. A lot of people are afraid to ask, but it's like if you're going to be a musician. Yeah, if you, I mean, if, if that's your main 
shtick. Like that's how you make your living. You got to be willing to ask for the things you need. Yeah. And and so I I feel like doing that has opened it up to me because I would always see these contests and these pageants and shit around M- Milwaukee where it's like, oh yeah, come and be part of this thing and we'll give you ten thousand dollars maybe if you know right. if, with plenty of strings attached. But we'll we'll give you this and you know and that'll be jumpstart your career. And I'm not saying like that's not going to help anybody. I'm sure it's helping a lot of people. But like to me, I was I I remember like thinking like well. Why do I need them? I already have people that care. That's, that's the way I always think about it. Yeah. I already have people that care. Why don't I just ask them and actually have them have a stake in it? Mm-hmm. Right? Like and 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 that's that's where that whole like pre-order fundraising aspect of it is where everyone who gives something they pre-order, they get a they get some they get a, something in reply. It's not a donation. It's I'm not asking for um for hand for donations, you know what I mean. I'm asking yeah. for I'm a, I'm asking for people to pre-order my my work, and by doing that, that allows me for it to happen and allows me to survive, because I get to I get to make vinyl and I get to make this merchandise. Oh, you are. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So there's vinyl. I'm doing a 15 CD box set too for to mark the 15th one, and there's a lot of stuff I still have to do, um, but I'm releasing it uh, song by song on Spotify and YouTube and all those platform, all the streaming platforms. Um, but I'm releasing everything, my whole album on my site on April 27th, like normal. Um, but that's been, that's going to be the only place they're going to be able to find it, um, on April 27th. And then every month, one song is going to be released for eight months. It's just, I, I like I, that. I like that approach. I, when I heard you were doing that, fine. I thought that was cool. It's fine. Like I, I, I necessarily like don't really care about releasing it eight months, but it just seems to be the most efficient way to use these platforms, mm-hmm. like especially Spotify we're talking about. Like that's really the main thing is Spotify, but YouTube as well. It's just, it's like, it's nice. People have, I've noticed that people seem to like to receive it like that too. Um, some people like to just listen to the whole thing and they want to have that album experience, but not right. a lot of people have album experiences anymore. And I'm not saying, you know, I, I just think compared to maybe a, I'm just so album focused mm-hmm. and all these platforms don't, they don't really incentivize a big drop like of many songs. They, yeah. incent, they want Spotify wants you to release one song every two to three weeks. And if you do that on Spotify, you'll have a better chance of getting picked up on their system and made slow. Cause every time it actually made a huge difference last year. And oh, I, really? I, I started doing that last year. I started releasing, but I would release two songs at a time because I was like, oh, well, I'll just do two. Because you know better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. I, like one of them, it'll be good enough. One of them will get it. And then I look back at the actual impact of, because Spotify puts them in algorithmic playlists for all the fans. And right. I have 5,000 followers on Spotify. And so um, all most most of them from, because I've been releasing my music for free. Like I'd say probably 95% of that is all because of that from mm-hmm. YouTube and from people finding the music on these games and all stuff like we we're talking about. Yeah. Um, but the, the impact of being on those algorithm pl- algorithmic playlists was huge. Like I'd look at the songs that I didn't submit for them to put on the algorithm play and significantly less um, plays. And I look at the graph every time the algorithmic playlist of listens Every time that it hits on the playlist, boom, there's a spike, mm-hmm. boom, and and then it train and Spotify learns. Okay, there's this guy's pumping out content, and if, and that's just one part of the equation for how they can determine to be putting on an editorial playlist, which is the the create is the the holy grail mm-hmm. of musicians is being on an editorial Spotify playlist or where you can you can just be on chill focus right and make and make tens of thousands of dollars a month like that'd be great it's so weird how many <laughs> and i see that on youtube too there's so many playlists that have just chill something or other and yeah. and there's so many of those how do who do you use to distribute so that you can get on spotify which which service do you use i use distrokid you do use distrokid uh, okay yeah i'm i've been really happy with them i i was on tunecore for a while um, but it this their 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 pricing structure and their support and all this stuff. Every it was just like Distro DistroKid was just so much better in all every aspect. Yeah. Just like it's just it is like and and it's just it's just a newer they 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 were built on way newer technology and better you know and 
uh, TuneCore was a problem for me. It might not be a problem for some people. Like, act, you do you know everyone needs to do their own due diligence if they're going to release stuff and yeah. actually look how much it costs and do it. It's simple math you can do um, to just determine that. Because some take percentages, like, oh, we'll take a 1%, or some just take a, oh, this is a one-time $50 fee or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, uh, I, I, I use DistroKid um, because when I was using TuneCore, I would have to pay $50 per year per album. And that's a problem for me because I have... And, many albums <laughs> and that's why i was asking too because releasing singles is another thing like i and i currently use a free one that has been fine with me and also because their distribution is far more european and south american like focused uh it's called one rpm oh, and I when i them. first well when i first started using them they also had an option for creative commons which is why i liked using it now they uh-huh. don't uh they got bought out by a company they were they were maintained in new york and then uh, a company in South America got the, uh, bought them, mm-hmm. and it's a lot more focused on different types of music in different countries, which mm-hmm. is fine. But they recently did a thing where now that YouTube and I don't know if other things are doing this as well, but being a Creative Commons artist and getting used in videos uh, because you allow people to freely use your music, like both of us do, one RPM since YouTube ne- or since Google now switched its music music service to YouTube Music you have to claim it. So it has content ID. It won't let you, like if anybody uses mm-hmm. it now that my, st- and all of my library got shifted over to that. So now all the people who were using my Damn. stuff for free, it says now you have to, I can have it approved and actually, you know, manually, yeah, manually one one. tell them like, okay, this video is using mine. But if somebody's using it for like a podcast theme yeah. or something like that, it's going to be every video. So that's that's why I'm looking for other ones, but there's the thing where like uploading a single, like how much is it? And then but that's that's nice to know about the playlist thing because if I am able to at least compensate for how much it costs, like for a single, it's like nine bucks or something like that, I think, isn't it? On DistroKid, I'm it's they it's a yearly it is one yearly. time. Okay. It's a yearly it's yearly like thirty bucks or something for a year, like for the regular. And you can un it's almost unlimited. Like it's like all right. It's not. It's not. It's. I don't know. Last. I. I have the like medium tier one. I think you need to have more. They do cap at something, but it was only like another ten, fifteen a, a year or something. Like, it was yeah. wasn't crazy. And and so I. I just use that. And they do have. Uh. They do have the option to to opt in to content ID or not. And so yeah. I and, luckily and that's what one RPM doesn't yeah. have that anymore. Now it's like, well, if you want us to do it because it's a free service, this is how we make our money. I, I experienced that ID. with TuneCore, that same thing you're doing. But I remember, and I never, I saw more money in the account from that one time when they were collecting content ID than ever. And I was just like, right. Fuck. like okay, <laughs> what, what do I do? Is this the moment where I, I say buy Creative Commons? I'm like, no way. Because right. I did this, the exact same thing happen. W- to me where all these all of a sudden I started getting videos or messages from these videographers and being like, Hey, I got this weird message. Like, is this okay? Like I thought this was free. And I was just like, I got my email, my inbox was just like tons of people, everyone being like, Hey, what's going on? And so I went to TuneCore cause I didn't, I didn't know. I, I told TuneCore to opt in and I was like, Oh, maybe this will, maybe, you know, we'll see what this, how this works. Mm-hmm. And, 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 uh, then I found out how it worked, and then, <laughs> and, and then I went back to them. I was like, "Please take everything off immediately." Yeah, like tell them to take it off, and then I did, and then everyone said it went back to normal. But like, I do worry about that about um, because you think about it, like a lot of people now they'll upload a video and not even publish it, but it'll strike it and they'll tell, "Hey, no, right. this is someone." So they won't even have the chance for you to. If they, if unless they know you personally or know that this is that they know about content ID and they know how this whole shit works, which most people, I mean, you kind of have to, and if you if you're a regular filmmaker and YouTube, but a lot of people don't want to don't want to worry about that, and if they're just gonna go, and that's the problem with some of these uh, with free music archive and stuff is the the data isn't sanitized, man. Like right. you don't know, you don't know. They're working what, on it. Uh, the new, the, oh, they are? I, I actually did an interview with, uh, uh, with Hessel who is, who owns uh tribe of noise out in the Netherlands. And they're the people that just bought the free music archive. 
And yeah, I was wondering. They, I know they brought it back to life. Yeah, and well, they I didn't know they what sort of have. They're they had. still working on it. Like I've been trying to claim my account since we spoke to them, and I still haven't heard back. And like I, I can log in, mm. but I don't like I can't claim my band yet on there for some reason. They huh. haven't got back to. They're doing it. Manually. I was able to. I was able. Oh, you to. were. Damn. Yeah. Well, then I got to try again. I, well, actually, I went and I, I was able to switch all of my albums actually to the the right. Because a lot of them are outdated when I was still using the share alike uh, stuff. I got rid of the share alike. Oh, you did. Um, thing. Yeah, so I moved everything over to just by license, the att- just the attribution. Okay. And it was part of the part of it was just like people don't people don't do it, and then people don't like it. They don't want to do it, or they don't they don't they don't care, or they don't just not educated. And so it's just like just make it easier. Like people are gonna use it like this anyway. Right. Just get rid of the share alike. It was like my way of like trying to see if they would pay, but it's like doesn't make sense. It's better to do like Kevin McLeod. I don't know if you know Kevin McLeod. Yep. The, he he had the his the perfect thing. It's just like you give it for free or you pay what you want. Yeah, Boom. that's the way it is. And actually, um, I've been part of what I've been working on this last year and stuff too is a little. I'm working on a um, a, a product or a service called Free Music Land, hmm. and it's free dot land and uh, you know. Try and just essentially use the model that I use, where it's streamlined, just the BY license and a pay what you want licensing, and um, start there, <laughs> and and also try to bring in the creators into into the space. And so I'm still working on it. So like people can go and sign up if, uh, if they want now. They can't. There's, they can't really do much. But um, I'm but I'm starting to this over the next. That's what I'm going to be focusing on this year. Actually, really is really cool. getting free music free music land up and up and running. And a lot of it is just you know things that I that that need that I mean I've been working in, in this Creative Commons niche of like on YouTube and Twitch and all these things like forever. I know I hear from filmmakers what they need. I know what, you know what they want and what they need and all the way and I have some ways to hopefully solve it. And that's you know some things where you know Free Music Archive really did well as as being an archive and they did right. that. Um, and but there is other aspects of you know that I for me were frustrating or like didn't solve certain problems and stuff. So, you know, without spilling too many to the beans, it's like, it, it's, it's a, it's in a progress, but it's very simple. And at, at the beginning and it's right now, like, in you know, in uh, just a site to, to sign up for, but um, I'm building the infrastructure of it. And I actually have some, some, in, some business partners now that are helping me like try to, try to, you know, really go at this full, full steam and do it right. And, and think about it in a, in a, right. in a sound business sense of, and solve the problems how they need to be. Like we've been going through all the different, all the different problems that need to be solved, and all the different what it, what are the different users, and what do they need to do, and what do they, you know, all that basic the basic stuff where it's nice. It's nice. So we'll see how that goes. But uh, you, can, you can, I was hoping it would be ready to release for for this album primarily on there. But um, yeah, that's 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 something that I'm really excited about. Next album. I, I think is a good shot of being a free music land exclusive. Nice. You know, well, and you'll so have to keep me posted on that. One. I will definitely keep you posted, man. <laughs> I, 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 I will be keeping many people posted as soon as I need. <laughs> I suppose that we'll, would be the concept of doing it. <laughs> when we, when we, I'm when not going to really... tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> no one must know. And that's well, perfect for our business. <laughs> and if, if people did want to check out your album, what would be the website that they go to, to listen to the new album? Color.com. They can go to they can go to my website and they can see that there. Free Music Land is just going to basically be a uh, like color is the prototype is okay. the way I look at it. Like color color is the prototype for Free Music Land. Like the way that I've been approaching my business in in the model using Creative Commons as the licensing layer, like that, um, and being able to do these fundraising and stuff and like all and easily have a merch and all these things where I hopefully streamline all that stuff in where people can get their syncs and they can connect and collaborate with filmmakers the way it needs to be instead of all these headaches right. and stuff and building robots that can actually go and be like, Hey, is this on content ID? That would be great. If mm-hmm. you actually knew that, wouldn't that be great? I think that would be great for, <laughs> for everyone to actually, for everyone to actually do that. I know filmmakers would be, yeah, it, it's so, so, happy <laughs> right and now with twitch and facebook like i've been hearing all this these stories of like i heard this story from this guy who was starting his own radio show he tried to use facebook he was he got he was using music from his n- neighborhood everyone was giving him permission to do it but didn't matter like right one of them is in some system 
somewhere and Facebook, it, you know, Facebook has that system and then just shuts the whole thing down. And so even, doesn't, they don't even care that he has permission. It doesn't matter. It's not, it's not part, that aspect, the rights, the rights holders don't actually seem to have the, like, it seems to be the, it's at the distributor level. They're not factoring right. in this. No, that, it's very much so that I've, yeah, I've had not, to fight yeah. that so many times. <laughs> they're not factoring it in. And so we'll see how it all turns out to be. And, you know, maybe, maybe NFTs are going to save us all, you know, <laughs> but it could be, man, I'm hoping for it, but maybe <laughs> in the future have programmable smart contracts for, for, uh, for licenses. You know, I think that'd be pretty great. Be pretty easy. If you figure Just, it out, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> that's phase two of free music land. Well, I want to thank you so much for being on the show today. I'm glad that we got the chance to connect and talk. Yeah, today. man. It's great to talk again. Thank you.